Hello everyone and welcome to the new episode of Beyond Viraj. Today we have with us Mr. Bias Dev Rilhan, the CEO and co-founder of Next Education. He is an alumni of IIT Bombay and London Business School. He is a visionary and technology enthusiast with a mission of revolutionizing education across the world. Welcome sir to the podcast and web series of Beyond Viraj. Thanks. Thanks sir. Nice to be here. great so first i would like to start with how next education is bringing about a revolution in the education industry for providing quality education okay yeah uh, okay see so look uh, when i started this business right uh, after our previous venture i was very sure that we want to do something which also has a bit of a social impact and fundamentally do a business which you know does not has a some more around globalization because as we know fundamentally look businesses are going global and certain business will scale will take over certain things so then when i looked at that and then within education you know k through 12 looked like a something which is very local to a country and uh, because of like various cultural language reasons etc and then within that when i looked at from a social angle mm. it looked like there's a lot of help and there's a lot of advancement which was happening towards you know what we call these people call it b2c in terms of preparing people for with means for entrance exams mm. i think that market has been saturated from 1991 probably you know or even earlier than that and you know enough people are ready to provide help in all the means possible but nobody was fundamentally working with schools to really really change some education there mm. so we thought that that's a good combination you know in terms of like you know focusing on b2b in terms of schools because that's not where a lot of people are coming in and that will bring a much bigger impact see look a lot of people emphasize the fact on that million kids appear for j mm. look hell million kids are not even a one like you know city students in b2b i mean the scales are like so different that uh, you know it's not even uh, like you know comparable so that was the main motivation for us to focus on b2b and even in this whole last decade of so many b2c unicorns and people ask me well, what you're trying to do that's what keeps us going saying look hey we are on a different path and a different journey and the way we are trying to bring you know fundamental changes look most of the time in india and especially in the school segment things what happens is innovations happen somewhere and they sort of force fit it to our society you know you know so like you know keep on giving people examples of like conflicts to you know toothpaste to like brushing two times like all these things a lot of those things are force fit and those kind of innovations don't scale they don't survive the test of time you know works in us let me open a setup here because i've got a degree from iit i think that formula is going to fail spectacularly over a time so we said okay look you know what do indian schools really really need and we started doing some amount of research and we realized look most of the people are getting digital content which was not built for india like you know the pearsons and the oxfords of the world how great they are they were not building for india and i will tell you we started with as fundamental research as to say at what word count does a child understand various subjects in indian context if his english is a second language there was no work done on that before 2007 8 9 you know when i started building the content you know and we started getting kids around and saying look you know, speak and let us see what do they retain and do all those things and we realized look what where it works and then even as basic as colors you know when you go to us and other places you make the hues of like you know red because most of the classes don't have too much of sunlight because a lot of them are ac they are in the colder regions they can't actually have a lot of open rooms right india has a lot more open rooms so you need hues of blue you know so there are a lot of uh, slight thing when people keep on saying like you know next education has the best content possible in this country the reasons are these subtleties look photosynthesis photosynthesis you know mm-hmm. there is only so many ways you can teach it and youtube is 
probably has covered thousand of them and probably thousand wrong ways also. So idea was to really fundamentally do certain amount of research and make it compatible for India. In terms of, I will tell you another way is like, you know, a lot of people when they make content in the Western world, they make it for self-absorption because the society emphasizes on teacher being the mentor and student being the learner, right? That, mm-hmm. That's the fundamental way to do mm-hmm. stuff. In India, that's not the real reality. Maybe you might wish to reach there, but that's not where we are. And that somebody has to go through that transition. So we realized like, the lecture is only 45 minutes in a school. So if you make any topic more than eight to 10 minutes, it's fundamentally useless. Mm. I'm talking of 2008, nine when the devices at home was anyways non-existent and the internet was like 3000 rupees a GB. You know, so idea was to give teacher only that much that they can use. So I was, so these were the core fundamental aspects on the content development, which we sorted. Then we actually made a remote uh, with uh, like, you know, finally, you know, in the end, Apple also made similar kinds of saying five buttons to 95% of the functionality. Okay, it's just like why we thought iPod was great because it was like really, really small things. And because when you go to a school, typically the teacher would say, I don't want to use computer because I, I have to turn my back to the students and then I'm gone. If you have to operate on a keyboard to everything, like it doesn't work. So you fundamentally have to give her a remote with which she can watch the students and then still do. So we came up with a remote with which the whole system in the class will work. And fundamentally only with five minutes, uh, five buttons. Fundamentally they can do everything, at least 90, 95% of the functionality. So then we made sure that the system can work independently in every class. So that to cost of adoption became 3,500 bucks a month. Uh, in 2011, Dan really trying to have this whole server and lots of computers. So the, uh, there was a series of innovations which needed to be done for me to launch really, really India's first pretty much affordable digital classroom. So much so forth, there was a need, like, you know, before us, there was a, you know, so-called unicorn publicly listed company in that space uh, called Educom. Okay. And uh, they had done in, I think, 10 years, probably 1800 schools or so. And I think we, in like, you know, 18 months did probably like, you know, 2000 plus schools. Of course, much, less, much smaller ticket size because we were allowing them to do it at a much smaller scale. So that's, so that was a validation which told us that, okay, look, if you will make a product for India, it will work. People will adopt if it is rightly priced and serviced. And we, you know, went through with that journey and uh, people liked it, even though all the big names of Indian, all the known names came, Reliance came, Tata came, you know, Pearson came, HCL came. Fundamentally, in the end, we ended up being the market leader and we are even by far margin even now in that space. And that product helped us make other products became a more of an organic journey. Mm-hmm. Like as we made a content, people liked our content. They said, look, why don't you give us books also, which match those? And that's how we launched the books. And even in the books, one of the first thing which we did was to actually put a QR code on every alternate page, because we realized students are not gonna get a complete platform access at home. But at Mm -hmm. least their parents can scan a QR code and put them talking of this like seven, eight years back before even the Patreon QR code probably was there, et cetera, right? So we did some of those things and the books came in and then it became, okay, look, you know, how do you sort out experiential learning? Then we came out with the labs and the science kits. And then, you know, fundamentally it became, okay, look, now the technology platforms and technology adoption is becoming a lot more, you know, smoother and the cost is becoming less. And then we came up with what we call is like a next OS, which is nothing but a school operating system, really Mm -hmm. saying that, anything which a school needs to run, right from their admissions, to their finances, to their HR, to their payroll, right up to personalized education, all can be done on this platform. So that's what we launched. So that's what the fundamental changes we brought to the Indian ecosystem to bring all these products at a much more affordable price. At a, in the innovation which matters in the sense, I'll tell you like, you know, one more thing. Like when I launched books, before me, nobody was printing ever a book on like the international quality paper, you know, nobody. So literally I I said, look, your children are not gonna read a book if it's not looking good. 
So we actually launched very, very good quality paper and people actually like that. Wow. We hopefully, you know, improved some of the standards towards those things. So that's what we did. That's how we built and what we have built till now has been on the basis of this. Focus on India, focus on innovation, which will become relevant for India. And try to have a patience because Indian adoptions are not going to be hockey stick mm. unless and until, like, especially in schools. School education scale in India. Even though it sounds illogical, but schools work on differentiation. You know, so your four neighboring schools are all not going to buy the same English book. Mm. You know, so they are not going to buy the same content because they're, how do they differentiate? So some of them are their business realities of life, right? So unless until you force it, like saying everybody has to buy an NCRT book, you do not see that around. So scaling up is a slow process. Innovation adoption in India is a slow process. So fundamentally working in thinking in decades rather than in years, and then slowly pushing that innovation by being around when the customer is ready. That's how we are trying to bring some amount of change in this country. That's nice. That's nice. And so there's a lot of uh, talking about the national education policy. So how the content that you are creating and the services that you are providing aid in implementing national education policy. They're like, are there any specific points catering to that? Like, would you like to talk? So, about? Look, in fact, I'm very happy that finally a policy came, which starts reflecting on the things, which is what we were trying to do in the private sector for long in terms of like, for example, I think, uh, you know, this 5334 is, first of all, itself is a good step mm. because children fundamentally, when you look at their mind development, align like that, you know, so the, you know, sending them in a very big school till their critical mind is awakened is not a good idea. Then focusing on, look, you know, environments, look, pre-primary school has a very different environment than a full-fledged school. And children need to be in that kind of environment for much longer time than just to be put into a very competitive, you know, dull kind of environment at the age six itself. So I think some of those things are very good. You know, US has already, and the researchers also already told that trying to take exams, et cetera, till you are like third standard in the age nine, when your cognitive skill starts developing is not a great idea. So I think some of those things will automatically now fall in line with just a simple fact that we are allowing pre-primary schools to run a five-year curriculum and three plus three and four, it will help. It, it, it's a great idea and it will happen. Second part is like all these things which we have been talking about in terms of trying to do experiential learning. You know, experiential learning has been one big part which has been missing in India. Mm. Look, there were reasons for it. It is not like policymakers are stupid, right? I mean, they're fairly intelligent people. See, now is when we have a sufficient amount of second generation learners that as a policy, we can expect parents to be involved in education. You know, in cities, it's very easy to say, look, why the teacher is not giving, oh, go sow the seed in the plant and then observe it, etc. Imagine in an unemployed house, on like uneducated house, it's not going to be possible. Maybe the mom is not even able to read the homework, you know. So now we can fairly be confident that, you know, at least 60, 70% kids are coming from a household which can help the child also at a home. So certain part of learning can be pushed at home. You know, so I think this experiential learning, making children observe and do a lot of activities because trust me, a lot of activities mostly has to be done at home because classroom does not have that much of time to do physical activities really as such, right? right. And, uh, you know, even to like simply think of cutting something, it's much better that the parents teach the child rather than a teacher imagining 40 kids with knives. That's not a very smart idea to be eating in the classroom, right? So idea is that that experiential learning implementation now is great. And then the flexibility. Look, India like has been very slightly late, I would say, in recognizing that the fact that everybody doesn't need a college degree. Mm. In fact, 80% of the degree uh, people, in my opinion, do not need a college degree. You know, I might be outliner here, but I feel if, if a society, 25% people are getting a college degree, it's getting overeducated, you know. So because most of the jobs require skills mm. and 30, 40% of the jobs require vocational skills. And that's why in India, you see high dropout ratio also, 
especially mm. in 11th, 12th, 9th, and 10th, because most of those guys don't need that education if you are trying to provide them. So if you go to countries like you know Italy, in fifth standard, they take a test. And based on child's ability, they put him in either El Clasico, which is classical, where you don't teach maths and science to the kids, very basic maths, no science, or El Scientifica. So figure out children's mindset and start moving. In Germany, after fifth standard, they start deciding which children should start learning vocational skills. So that by the time you finish up your high school, you're an efficient plumber already, or an efficient brick mason, you're an efficient electrician. So they allow the opportunity for the people who are not gonna pursue academics as pure academics or deeper academics like STEM to gain skills while they're gaining general knowledge, they're increasing their awareness, they're enjoying their childhood. You know, so that's very important. That's very productive for the society. You know, trying to finish a BTEC engineering and then doing an MBA and then selling soaps is probably not the efficient way of, you know, going about as a country's resources, mm. you know, or becoming a writer or whatever it is, right? So idea is that vocational skills introduction now and emphasizing that every school offers that from ninth onwards, especially in rural areas and in tier three, tier two towns, if implemented properly, will lead to a lot less school dropouts. Mm. I think after midday meal, this is probably one of the most significant impacts of the NEP policy. So I think this two, three points itself, if get done with this NEP policy, will bring a fundamental change in the country. That's nice. That's a great perspective, sir. And uh, you talked about the activities. So uh, from your expertise over the years and the data that you have, what are the additional activities or say projects you ask your partner schools to undertake apart from the curriculum for holistic development of child? Okay. See, so what happens is one of the big thing which is happening and, uh, you know, as it started pretty much in the West, right? When they said, when you get an engineering student, ask him, what does he want to make? So today, if you go to Singapore National University, right, Technology University, if you're joining a mechanical engineering stream, they fundamentally ask you, are you do you want to build a bike or a car? Okay. And you're fundamentally at the end of the fourth year, you're supposed to produce that. Right. Okay, so, and you're supposed to take the courses along with it of those knowledge and then stop building all that. So the idea is that, you know, taking that grand idea and putting it at a much smaller scale is what, the NEP is also talking and we also talk about this to say, okay, look, why can't our children make a pressure cooker in eighth standard? Mm. Or a simple thing like a firecracker. Everybody gets excited with firecracker. And firecracker teaches you chemistry, physics, building things, painting, creativity. So the idea is to, government of India now is recommending as well as we do is try to find two holistic uh, projects one in each semester, which the children do, which is relevant to what they're studying during that time. Right. And that will help them get certain places. So that is what Look, if you're studying this, this has a meaning, this has a relevance. Because we, you and I, we all, I should not compare myself to you, you're probably 20 years younger than me. All of our previous generations have grown education really with the always wondering when am i going to use this mm. or why am i going to use it? right so that really really i think is a very helpful activity so that's what we mean by experiential learning and second part is bringing it even to further micro level right you know we have started creating for every class 10 activities which are very small which is like a probably a two-hour activity or a 45 minute activity to two hour activity. Like for example, principle of bullet train. I'll tell you can be taught in 30 minutes and you can actually make a bullet train in 30 minutes because you have to put three magnets and make something stand above the surface and show the child. So the child understand how does the bullet train works. Or, you know, you teach objects vibration so that you show how the phone vibrates. Mm. So you so we have made for every class 10, 10 such concepts. Look, this is a great work done by one previous IIT professor, IIT or IIT professor, Mr. Atul Gupta, he actually popularized it, made everything free. Okay. You know, uh, this great guy, uh, and he said, okay, how do we make cheap science models in our country? Because we can't afford $20, $40 kits. Mm. So we fundamentally made something which in a thousand bucks, a child can do 10 experiments in a year. 
and children. So, so those are the kind of things which we're talking of exchanging children at a micro level, then at a semester level, and then fundamentally as a goal when you take up a graduation of what you want to practically end up being in that. Wow. Got it. Got it. Now, sir, I have a few questions for the entrepreneur within you. So when we talk about the ed tech company, there's a lot of talking going right now in the market. And especially when we talk about ed tech, then they are seeing a downfall right now. And we have seen in the news that layoffs have been done, but uh, you have managed to keep, keep it alive and that to at scale. So I want to know, how did you do that? See, look, uh, as I was telling you, look, uh, not in business, there is a saying that, you know, only thing which fails is a CAM, total addressable market. Nothing else fails. You fundamentally, you know, you, you make assumption of any business is total addressable market. Mm. Based on that, build the models. Based on that, you build a scale. And based on that, you try to gather the speed to everything. It was, as I was telling you, so like in my mind, fundamentally in B2C schools, uh, companies, which are seeing slight amount of hesitations right now has been because of the their assumptions around total addressable market. Look, in India, probably like you know, 3 million kids aspire for IIT and probably another million for medical. And so probably there are 50 million kids every year who are doing stuff. And, you know, online, offline, everybody's going to offer them services, etc. And that's where it is. It's not going to become 100, 200, 300 million. You know, so I think people are now realizing what is a real addressable market is. Just like, I'll give you an example, like, you know, Flipkart has 75 million downloads. And eventually, I don't think there are more than 3 million people who order more than 500 bucks per year. So I think B2C guys they have to reset their TAM expectations. That will fundamentally bring down certain amount of speed and scale. And that's so the way I have been, as I'm telling you, look, we are very, very clear that the addressable market in India is around 60,000, 70,000 private schools where we focus on. Mm. and rate of adoption as i told you look you know so once you have a tam and then you put a rate of adoption to it is how you start deciding your burn rate yeah so for me as i told you in education things happen in decades not in years mm. you know everybody will start using adaptive tests to know their personal you know learning levels i think is a 2025 project then a 2021 project which is a lot, lot of people thought through so i think so that's how we have been able to afford that we are keeping our aspirations manageable within our burn rates and with the understanding that how will market adopt because look in the end people don't have unlimited supply of money right most of the schools in india charge only 2000 rupees per month as a school fee hmm. then if i can launch a b2c personalized learning however great it is cannot be at 30000 rupees a year right how many will fundamentally afford it right you know so idea is that when we'll be trying to launch something we are very cognizant of the fact that total cost of innovation by indian student cannot be more than one and a half times his monthly fee hmm. and that should include books etc everything then only you can do something at a scale so we try to think of like 500 rupee product 200 rupee product you know thousand rupee product and then say okay it's going to get adopted slowly as the people's income levels increase aspiration levels increase their allocations changes from you know watching movies maybe to their children's education that's so that's why so that's how we have survived you know having our own understanding of tam and the rate of adoption at affordable price got it and sir uh, what is your biggest failure in life and what did you learn from that experience see uh, one of the biggest failures of ours was look you know when i started this company look you have to understand it came from a back of a huge success. Like the people who started this company before this probably made one of the biggest companies in this country, people from this country ever has made, right? It was a huge gaming company, almost like a $10 billion worth. You know, had a bigger IPO than Google. Yeah, okay. So raised more money than Google when it went public. So the idea was that we thought what people are doing right now, we did that in 2007, 9, we thought, if you push in enough money and you you bring it out there, people will adopt. Hmm. I think that's very, very, you know, wrong of us. Like, for example, when I launched digital classrooms, I launched for all the state boards in seven languages, all in one shot. 
and i think local languages content is getting adopted now now with of csr and the government initiatives and everything right when i launched the books i launched the books for all the classes and three boards okay. so if the biggest uh, problem as i was telling you mistake has been is that you assume lot of things about people wanting that innovation which you are building hmm you always better off testing now i have a big fan of mvp now i'm saying is look you know you launch small have the ability to scale and execute if you see confirmation otherwise you move to the other thing right you know so that's what has been my learning especially in indian markets which are very very price sensitive i think first mover is a advantage in india you know because innovation will get copied cheaply but will not get adopted fast enough that you get that dividend Yeah. so doing it right and efficiently is lot more important in this country you know so you might be super surprised that who wins the grocery race eventually in the end than you know the names we are seeing today same thing might happen in e-commerce same thing might happen in lot of other things so that's that's what has been my learning and change in my strategy nice now sir i have three questions uh one is first one is if you could go back and give your 18 year old self one piece of advice what would, what would it be i think first advice would have been is take academics seriously i think you know we all who grow up in india have a healthy disregard for what we are taught in the class because we don't see immediate practical use but i think being book smart is a lot more important than being street smart when you're going to be an entrepreneur and going to solve hard problems and problems which do not get the answer from google your frameworks you're going to learn the fundamentals you're going to learn the rigor in studying which you're going to learn is going to help you so i would try to give that feedback back that thing that going to iit doesn't mean now that's just uh, dancing around right probably be a bit more serious about it okay so what's your favorite quote sir see my favorite quote has been is a mother uh, assumption is a mother of all fuck ups as i keep on telling you you know i feel people make assumptions and then on that they build the story and then fundamentally never recheck those assumptions or when they execute they do not attribute risk to those assumptions mm, you know okay. i think uh, people get a very hard learn, earning part for that so that's why nice and this one question i asked to all of my guests is uh, what is success according to you see look success for me i think if you ask me at a bit more personal level because we had some amount of commercial success in the previous venture is having a sustainable business which has a positive social impact i think is success for me you know we might not be the biggest company we might not be a unicorn to everything but it gives me satisfaction that if you as a person who got educated in this country got all the benefits can create an employment or direct or indirect for 10000 people impact the life of lot many students in a positive manner and in the while make money great that to me is a success nice and any so final words or comments for all our listeners look my take is look always assess your risks i think like you know we by nature men we are judging our abilities are very optimist you know so it is very very important when when you plan you be an optimist but when you review be a pessimist and then you will find the balance in your plans otherwise i think it becomes tough to navigate especially being the ceo of a company my whole day work is how do you reduce a risk anything which can make you die you know mm-hmm. or failure is what you should be eliminating mm-hmm. what will make you your team members will take care of it you know you as a head as a person responsible for making sure that the money flow exist in the organization for it to survive and live another day to transform into whatever self it will be that's key so doing that i think everybody who is an entrepreneur is focusing on his business as a ceo should be focusing on things which can shut your company how are you minimizing those risks no wow. that's a that's a valuable advice sir thank you so much for your wise words and thank you so much sir for uh, contributing your perspective and telling us many things that would be valuable for us so thank you so much sir for doing this podcast thank you thanks sir thanks for this opportunity